Now that you're familiar with some of the most basic and most useful DOS commands, let's take a look at the more advanced commands. Again, this chapter will cover the commands in alphabetical order. The first command is the append command. This is a very important command. What it does is set up directories so that they will be searched for data files or other files which don't have the extensions of exe, com, or bat, which are searched for by the path command. This means that you don't have to be in the directory the file is in to use it. Normally, you should use append to define a path to the directory where your data files are located if you must be in a different directory while using the program which uses those files. Append tells DOS where to search for these files if and when you try to use one of them. It is always advisable to use the drive name in the command so that the complete path to the directory is specified. Otherwise, if you set up an append like backslash msword, intending the msword directory on the C drive to be searched, but we're working on the D drive, DOS would try to search for backslash msword on D instead of C. The slash x switch is used to immediately set the append directory to the current directory. In this way, you don't have to explicitly specify the current directory in the command itself. The slash e switch is used to enter the append paths into the DOS environment. Both the slash x and slash e switches can only be used the first time you use append. Using append alone causes the current append directories to be displayed. Using append with a single semicolon causes the append to be reset to nothing. Setting an append path does not cause DOS to search those directories for program or batch files. Use path for that. Let's set an append. Type append c colon backslash lotus backslash graphs semicolon c colon backslash lotus backslash worksheets and strike enter. This sets a path to the Lotus Graphs and Lotus Worksheets directories. This tells DOS to search these directories when looking for the necessary files. Type append and strike enter. This would display the current active append such as append equals c colon backslash Lotus backslash graphs semicolon C colon backslash lotus backslash worksheets. Now, type append semicolon and strike enter. This sets the active append back to nothing, no append. For a more detailed explanation, see path, since it's essentially the same. The only difference is that append searches for data files, while path searches for programs or batch files. A data file is something you create while using a software package. A program, on the other hand, is the software package itself. For example, you may have created a spreadsheet using a spreadsheet package and saved it with a file name under a certain directory. If you want to call that file up while you're using the spreadsheet package in a different directory, you use append to tell DOS where to search for the file. The next command is the assign command. This command allows you to rename a drive so that it operates by a different drive letter as well as its original one. This is useful in particular for application programs which can only work with a particular drive letter such as B colon when your data is on another drive such as C colon. However, there are reasons you should not always use assign. First, Microsoft recommends that you become used to using the substitute command instead of assign because assign may not be included in future versions of DOS. The substitute command can perform the same function as assign. Second, the assign command can confuse DOS as to what type of drive it is working with, floppy or hard. This is a problem with commands such as backup and restore which need this information. Therefore, do not use assign and these commands together. Finally, Microsoft further recommends that you not use assign except where necessary. That is, it should be used only when it is required by a program. The letters X and Y in the syntax stand for drive letters. You should not use a colon after the drive letters. You may, however, specify as many drive assignments as you wish with one command. If you type assign by itself, all the current drive assignments will be removed and the computer will operate as usual. Let's make drive B into drive C. Type assign B equals C and strike enter. This command would refer all reads and writes that would normally go to drive B to drive C instead. 
Read and write simply refers to retrieving data from a disk or saving data to a disk. This might be necessary for some older programs which were written to be used with two disk drive machines when you have only one disk drive and a hard drive. The next command is the attribute command, abbreviated attrib. The attrib command is used to set the attribute of a file or a group of files. The attribute you can change with attrib are the read-only status of the file and the file's archive bit. You make a file read-only by specifying the plus R switch in the command line. When a file is set to be read-only, it cannot be erased, renamed, or written to, only read from. To change a file back to read-write status, you must remove the read-only attribute by using the minus R switch. In the same way, you can change the archive bit of a file. The archive bit tells DOS whether a file has been changed. You see, each time DOS modifies a file, it sets the archive bit on for that file. And each time a backup is made of the file, the archive bit is reset to off. For example, when you first create your files, their archive bits are turned on. If you back up your files using backup, their archive bits are turned off. Now suppose you continue working with some of your files, but not all of them. If you use a file which has its archive bit turned off, the bit will be turned back on since the file is now different than it used to be. If you don't touch a file, its archive bit will not be changed. Now suppose you make another backup of your files using backup with the slash M switch. Only the files with their archive bits turned on will be backed up. The files with their archive bits turned off haven't been changed in any way since the last backup you made. Therefore, there is no need to back them up again. The archive bit turned off does just that. It prevents those files from being backed up again. Of course, only if you use the slash M switch, as I said. If you don't use slash M with backup, your entire hard disk will be backed up, regardless of the archive bit setting. In short, the archive bit helps DOS determine whether or not a file needs to be backed up. If the bit is on, a backup is necessary and will be made. So if you wanted to have a file included in a backup, for example, but the file's archive bit is not currently on because you haven't worked with it since the last backup you did, you can turn it on yourself. You turn the archive bit on by using the plus A switch with the command and turn it off by using the minus A switch. To see the current status of the attributes of a file or a group of files, you can use the attrib command by itself with no switches, only the file names. If you want the attrib command to work on files which are not in the current directory, use the slash s switch. This also causes all the subdirectories to be searched for files. Now, type attrib plus r letter 1 period doc and strike enter. This command would add the read-only attribute to the file letter one period doc. Type attrib asterisk period doc space slash s and strike enter. The command in this form would display the attributes for all the files with a doc extension in all the subdirectories. If you see an R an A, or both, next to the file name, then that attribute is turned on for that file. If not, that attribute is turned off. The next command is the backup command. The backup command is one of the most important but least used DOS commands. It is used to backup or make copies of files or whole disk drives. You should use this command so that you will have copies of valuable data or programs in case anything should happen to the originals. From looking at the syntax for the backup command, you would think that the command is very complex. However, this is only because the backup command is very versatile. Each of the switches has a specific purpose. When using the backup command, the first thing you must specify is the drive, path, and file names of the files you want to back up. And usually, these would be files on your hard drive. Then you must specify the drive where the backup will be made. This is usually a floppy drive. You follow these with the different switches if needed. The first switch listed is the slash s. Using this switch will cause the backup command to look in all the subdirectories for the files you specify to be backed up. This is especially handy when you want to back up your whole disk at once. The next switch is the slash m. This is a special switch that is related to the attrib command we just talked about. When you use the slash M switch, backup will only backup the files which have their archive bit set on.
that is, the files that have been changed since the last time you made a backup. The backup command will reset the archive bit to off when the files have been backed up. You can use the attrib command to manually set the archive bit of a file to on or off so that it will be backed up accordingly. Next we have the slash A switch. This switch is used to append a backup to an existing backup. This requires a little explanation. You see, when you make a backup, you normally do so onto blank diskettes. This is because backup will erase anything in the root directory of the disks you use if you don't use the slash A switch. If you do use the slash A switch, DOS will add the new backup to the one already existing. However, this will not work if the first backup was done with an earlier version of DOS, so you must be careful. As I said, you usually use blank diskettes for your backups. With previous versions of DOS, you also had to make sure that the disks were already formatted when you used them. With this version of DOS, though, you can use the slash F switch to automatically format any disks which are not. In order for this switch to work, you must have access to the format command, either by having it in the current directory or in a directory specified by the current path, as discussed in the first DOS command section. The slash D switch is used to specify a date. The date you enter here is used to select certain files to be backed up. The way it works is this. DOS looks for and backs up any file that has a date listed in the directory, which is later than or equal to the date you entered here. Related to this is the slash T switch. With this switch, you can enter a time that DOS will use to back up only files with a time listed in the directory, which is later than or equal to the time you entered. The final switch you may enter is the slash L. By specifying this switch, DOS will create a file called backup period log, or alternatively, a name you specify after the L. This file will contain the names of the files that were backed up. This might be useful when you run your backup from a batch file or when you are not in attendance during the process. You can review the contents of this file when you return to verify that the files you wanted to be backed up actually were backed up. Once you initiate a backup, you will be asked to insert blank disks. It is important to know in what order the disks were created, so it is a good idea to number the disks as you enter or remove them. If and when you restore the disks, you must enter them in the same order. Backup can also be used to copy a file, which is larger than a single diskette can hold, onto multiple diskettes. This is useful because th this cannot be done with the copy command. To do this, simply specify that file's name on the command line. Let's do an example. Type backup c colon backslash asterisk period asterisk a colon slash s slash f. Now this is probably the most useful form of backup and the first one you'll want to use after you have your hard disk set up the way you want it. This command will back up the entire contents of drive C and format all the floppies you put in drive A for the backup. Now once you've done this, keep these disks in a safe place and do not use them again. Strike control C to stop this backup so we can continue. The next time you use backup, use a command like this. Type backup C colon backslash asterisk, period, asterisk, a colon, slash, m, slash, f. This form of the command will back up only the files you've worked on since the last backup. That way the backup takes up less diskettes and can always be combined with the previous backup if you need to restore your entire disk. To combine disks when restoring, just make sure you put them in the computer in the same order you took them out. In other words, if you run backup for your hard drive and it fills five disks, then a month later you run another backup of the same hard drive that requires three disks, you can combine the eight disks when restoring the data. The only thing you must do is restore, in order, the first five disks, then restore, in order, the last three disks. Again, strike Control c to abandon this backup since we don't really want to back up the C drive. To make a copy of a single file, which is larger than one diskette can hold, do the following. Say you have a document called Joe.doc in the letters directory on your hard drive C, and you want to back it up on floppy disks in drive A. Type backup C colon backslash letters backslash Joe.doc space A colon, and replace disks in drive A as instructed by the computer. And be sure to always number the backup disks so you know what order to restore them in. 
strike control C since we're not actually performing this backup. You can then use the restore command to install a file on another computer in this manner. Type restore A colon C colon backslash letters backslash Joe period doc and put the floppies into drive A in order as instructed by the computer. This is essentially the exact opposite procedure as backup. In this section, the first command is the break command. There is a special keystroke called break, which causes the execution of many programs to stop. And normally, when DOS is running a program, it only checks for you typing a break, that is, a control C, when it performs I-O to a peripheral. I-O functions include writing on the screen, printing on the printer, or waiting for you to type something on the keyboard. However, you can change when DOS will look for a break. If you turn break checking on, DOS will check for a break under many more circumstances, such as while you're using the floppy or hard disk. This might be useful if you're not quite sure what a command or program will do and you want to have an opportunity to stop it. For example, you may execute a program you're unfamiliar with only to find that it takes a great deal of time to set itself up. Meanwhile, you're unable to use your computer and you can't stop the program. Well, break allows you to type control C to stop the program at any time and return you to the DOS prompt. However, Turning extended break checking on can slightly slow the execution of your programs. Therefore, you can always turn break checking off again if you need to. Here's how to use break. Type break on and strike enter. This turns extended break checking on. Type break and strike enter. This displays whether break checking is currently on or off, such as break is on. The next command is the check disk command. This command does three important things. First, it checks a disk for problems in a directory structure or in the file allocation table, which could result from a power failure, for example. Second, the amount of space taken up by the files and directories, as well as the free space remaining, is displayed when this command is run. This is helpful in keeping free space open on your disks. Third, the amount of RAM you have installed and that which is currently not being used is also displayed. If problems are found by check disk, they will be shown as error messages and you will be asked if you wish them fixed. However, even if you confirm that you want the errors fixed, this will not be done unless you use the slash F parameter, even though it asks the question. Using the slash V switch will cause a listing of all the files and subdirectories on the disk to be displayed as they are checked. And this is useful for seeing all the files on the disk. If you use a file name in the command, that file will be checked for fragmentation, the spreading out of the data on many separate parts of the disk. And you'll be told how many non-contiguous blocks the file consists of. Let's check the C drive. Type check disk C colon and strike enter. This is the normal way to execute the command and will result in a display like this. This shows that the total disk space is about 30 megabytes and that most of that space is still available after the DOS files have been loaded. It also shows that the machine has the maximum DOS memory of 640 kilobytes and that over 590,000 bytes are still free after DOS has been loaded. Type check disk C colon slash V greater than PRN and strike enter. Now, this command has a couple of new things in it. First, the greater than sign is called a redirection character. What it does is take all that stuff that would normally go to the screen and send it to the device or file which follows it on the command line. The PRN stands for the printer. This command will take all the output of the command shown here and send it to the printer. Note that it will send it to the printer which is attached to the first parallel port, LPT1. If you want to send it to a different printer, you must use the mode command. Now see mode for how to do this. Since the check disk command with the slash V switch lists all the files and subdirectories on drive C, that is what will be printed out, assuming your printer is properly connected and turned on. Next is the compare command, abbreviated COMP. 
Comp is used to check if two files or two groups of files are exactly alike, that is, if they contain exactly the same information. For two files to pass the compare test, they must be identical down to the last byte. For example, if you have two copies of the same letter and then change just one character in one of the copies, the two files will not pass the compare test. When you run comp on these files, you will see a message giving the offset or number of bytes from the beginning of the file where the difference lies. If the files you are comparing are very different, each difference will receive a similar message up until 10 differences have been found. At this point, the compare process will stop. You will also receive a message if the two files are different sizes to begin with. If you give comp two sets of files to compare by using wildcards, the files will be compared in pairs, starting with the first two files found, which match the file specs given. For comparing text files, it might be better to use the FC command, which shows any differences much more clearly than the comp command does. For example, type comp A colon asterisk period doc space C colon asterisk period doc and strike enter. This is the most common use of comp. This form of the command would compare all the doc files in drive A with those in drive C. You might do this after you've made a copy of all these files. To compare two whole diskettes, use the discomp command instead. The next command is the discomp command. This command is usually used after disk copy to make sure that the copy was successful, since DOS does not check this on its own. The syntax is the same as for disk copy, except that you may use the slash 8 switch to check diskettes, which were formatted with 8 instead of 9 sectors per track. This would be the case if the disk was formatted with DOS version 1. If the disks are not identical, an error message will be displayed. If you get an error message, try the copy again. If you get another error message, the source disk may be copy protected, or the target disk may be bad. Try another diskette. Be aware, however, that just because two disks contain the same files, they are not identical. For the two disks to be identical, the files must also occupy exactly the same sectors on the disk. Let's compare the disks we copied using disk copy. Type discomp A colon B colon and strike enter. You will then be asked to place the original disk in drive A and place the copy in drive B. Then you must strike any key to start the comparison. This checks the disk in drive B against the one in drive A. When the comparison is done, you'll either be told the compare was OK, or you'll be told there were errors. You'll then be asked if you want to compare another disk. Type Y for yes or N for no and continue. The first command in this section is the fast open command. Each time DOS opens a file, it must look up the name and location of the file on the disk. If you're running an application which opens and closes many files repeatedly, such as a database, the time necessary to perform this task can add up. Using the fast open command can reduce this time. When you use the fast open command, DOS stores the name and location of an open file in RAM. By doing this, DOS can access this information much faster the next time the file needs to be opened. You can use the fast open command with up to four different hard disks at a time. It will not work with floppy disks. The value designated by the three ends in the command syntax is the number of files DOS will keep track of. This value can range from 10 to 999. The default value is 10. Note that 40 bytes of memory are taken up for each value you specify. Thus, you should only use a number as great as the number of files you expect to be opening at any time. To use fast open, type fast open C colon equals 10 and strike enter. This command will set up space to keep track of 10 files in drive C. The next command is the FC command. This is another command which compares files. However, unlike the older comp command, the FC command gives you a better description of the differences between the files you are comparing. Rather than just giving you an offset into the file and the two bytes that don't compare, FC also shows the lines that are different. As you can see from the syntax, there are many switches you can use with FC. 
The first switch is the slash A. When you use this switch, you tell FC to abbreviate its output. In this case, FC will display only the beginning and ending lines of the section of the files which are different. If you don't use this switch, FC displays all the different lines. The next switch is the slash B. As you can see from the syntax, this is used to set up a binary comparison. By specifying a binary comparison, the comparison will be much like that of the comp command. That is, you will be given only the offset and the actual bytes which differ in the files. As I said before, this is useful if you are comparing programs or non-text data files, but not much help for text files. Next, there is the slash C. When you use this switch, FC will ignore the case of characters in the file. This means that a capital A is the same as a lowercase a. The slash L switch is just the opposite of the slash B switch. When you use the slash L switch, FC will compare the files as text or ASCII code instead of as binary files. By default, FC will compare the files as text files if the file names do not have extensions of exe, com, sys, obj, lib, or bin. If your files have one of these extensions and you want a text comparison, then you must use the slash L switch. The next switch, slash LB, requires a little explanation of how FC works. Since FC displays the differing lines in the files after it has finished the comparison, it must have somewhere to store these lines while it works. The number you specify for N after this switch is the number of lines that FC will store while it works. If FC finds more consecutive differing lines, the comparison will be aborted. By default, this number is set to 100, which should be more than enough for most files. For some comparisons, especially ones with large files, it would be helpful to not only see the differing lines, but also to know which lines they are. You can have FC tell you the line numbers of the differing lines by using the slash N switch. For example, Rather than just being shown the lines themselves, which may not be easily recognized in a large document, you'll also be told the line numbers of the incorrect lines. On a typewriter, you set the positions of your tabs. It's the same with most word processors. However, different word processors save tabs differently, depending on the codes used by the programmers. Some will save them as the actual amount of spaces present, while others save them as the special tab character. DOS, on the other hand, will always treat tab characters as eight spaces. Therefore, if you want tab characters to be treated as tab characters rather than as spaces, you can use the slash T switch. Another similar switch is the slash W. Using this switch will cause FC to treat all spaces and tabs as something called a single white space. That is to say, 20 spaces in a row and 10 spaces in a row both will be compressed to a single white space and not be considered different. If you don't use the slash W switch, this would be dealt with as a difference between the files. Finally, the last thing you can enter is shown in the syntax as slash four ends. The value you enter here is the number of lines which must match each other to be considered the same. The default value is two. This means that two consecutive lines must match after a differing line, or they will also be considered different. As you can see, this command is much more valuable than the simple comp command, especially if you are comparing text files. For example, type fc slash a slash c slash n joe letter period doc mike letter period doc, and strike enter. Using the command in this way would compare the files Joe letter period doc and Mike letter period doc as text files, since they don't have one of the characteristics extensions we listed above. In addition, I've told FC to abbreviate its output and also to show the line numbers of the lines it finds to be different. To make FC ignore the possibility that I might have capitalized something in one file but not in the other, I also use the slash C switch. With so many possible switches, you have a multitude of options for setting up FC to satisfy your needs. The next command is the fdisk command. fdisk is a command which almost everyone will have to use at least once, though many may have someone more experienced do it for them. This need not be the case because using fdisk is very simple. fdisk is the program which creates the partition table on your hard drive. 
The partition table is where information is kept about how your drive is configured. It tells how large each partition on the disk is, whether it is a DOS partition, and which partition the computer should try to boot from. As I mentioned when we set up a hard disk, DOS will only boot from partitions which are 32 megabytes or less in size. So if your hard drive is larger than this, you will need to create more than one partition. The only way to get around this is by using one of several programs on the market which make subtle changes to DOS to allow it to work with larger partitions. However, you might want to look at the join command, which lets you use two hard drives almost as one. As you can see, there are no switches for F-Disk. Instead, you are presented with a menu that has five choices. Create DOS partition, change active partition, delete DOS partition, display partition information. We'll go through each one of these choices now. The first choice, create a DOS partition, is the one that you must run before you can use a hard disk for the first time. When you pick this option, another menu will appear. Create primary DOS partition, create extended DOS partition. A primary partition is a partition which can be bootable. Remember that a primary partition, like any other partition, can only be up to 32 megabytes in size. An extended partition allows DOS to use the remaining space on your hard disk as a different drive. These other drives cannot be bootable. In order to use extended partitions, you must tell DOS what drive names you wish them to be called. For each of these options, there will be yet another menu. For the first two options, you'll be asked questions about how large you wish your partitions to be. In these instances, you should remember that a hard disk not only has sectors and tracks, like a floppy disk, but also has cylinders. A cylinder is all the tracks and all the platters that are the same distance from the edge of the disk, that is, all the tracks that are above one another. It's important to know this because F-Disk will ask you how many cylinders you wish each partition to be. In each case, you will be told the maximum size, and you may choose this simply by hitting return. If you wish a different size, you can calculate how many cylinders are needed because you know how large the whole disk is, and you know how many cylinders it has in all. The process you would normally go through for, say, a 40 megabytes drive would be this. First, set up the primary DOS partition for, say, 20 megabytes, or half the number of total cylinders. Then, return to F-Disk and set up an extended partition, which consists of the remaining disk space. Since only 20 megabytes are left, this will be the default value. If more than 32 megabytes were left, the default value would be 32 megabytes. Under almost all circumstances, the only operating system you will have on your disk is DOS. If this is the case, you need not worry about changing the active partition, since the primary DOS partition will be made active automatically. If you ever want to change the size of a partition, you'll first need to delete it. You can do this with the third option on the main menu. However, you should back up any data you want to keep, since deleting a partition completely wipes out any data on it. You can also use this to delete the drive names given to the extended partition. This will also erase all the data there. You may at any time look at the setup of the partitions on your drive by choosing option 4, Display Partition Data. This will display a list of all the partitions on the disk, primary, extended, and even non-DOS partitions. You'll be shown the starting and ending cylinder numbers, the size and the status and type of the partition. If you have an extended partition, you will be asked if you want to see the logical drive information for it. Again, you'll be shown the size information for these logical drives. After you have your hard disk all set up with F-Disk, you must still run format. For an example of using F-Disk, see setting up the hard disk earlier in the lesson. Our next command is the find command. Now, this command is used to find a string of characters in a file. The characters you want to look for are entered in the command as string. You must use the quotes around the characters. If the string you are looking for has quotation marks in it, you can use single quotes around the string. If you use find without any switches, it will display any line it finds in any of the files which contains the string you entered. On the other hand, the slash v switch is used to find all the lines which do not contain the specified string. If you use the slash c switch, find will tell you the number of lines which contain the string. If you use slash c with slash v, find will tell you how many lines don't contain the string. And finally, the slash n switch will give you the line number of each displayed line. If you try to use the slash c and slash n switch together, the slash n switch will simply be ignored. 
Let's look for a string. Type find quotation June 15, comma, 1985, end quote, contract period doc, and strike enter. This command will find and display the line or lines containing this date in the file contract period doc. Here's another way to use the find command. It employs a feature of DOS called a pipe, and it works like this. Suppose you know you have a file called letter period doc on your hard drive, but you can't remember which subdirectory it's in. Well, instead of going through the drive directory by directory until you find it, you can use find instead, like this. Type check disk slash v bar find quote letter period doc, end quote, and strike enter. As we saw before, check disk slash v will list all the files on your hard drive. The next character is called a bar. It's not the same as a colon. When used in a DOS command, it's called a pipe. What a pipe does is transfer the output of one command to the input of another. We use it here to feed the file list that check disk slash v creates to the find command. Find will display the location of the file. Note that you must type the file name within the quotes in all capitals, or this example will not work. The first command in this section is the graphics command. When you use print screen by pressing the shift and print screen keys, DOS usually prints only text screens properly. To allow graphics screens to be printed properly, you must first run the graphics program. You need only run this once. When you run this command, you must specify which type of printer you have. The choices are shown in your manual. If you do not specify a printer type, the default would be the graphics printer. This is also the one which works with most non-IBM printers, such as an Epson. The slash B switch is used to print the background of the screen in color. This is only valid if you are using a color printer with the color 4 or colors 8 options. With the slash P switch, you set which port the printer is connected to. The port may be set to either 1, 2, or 3. These correspond to the ports LPT1, LPT2, and LPT3. Normally, when you print a screen, the black portions of the screen are not printed, but are left white, and the white portions of the screen are printed black on the paper. However, you can reverse this by using the slash R switch. And finally, if you are using an IBM convertible, you should use the slash LCD switch to print graphic screens from the LCD display. Now, type graphics and strike enter. This is usually all you have to enter in order to print out graphic screens on your computer. It will work with most printers, even those not made by IBM. The printer must be a dot matrix or other type which can print graphics. The next command is the join command. We talked before about using the fdisk command to break up your hard disk into separate partitions of less than 32 megabytes. This is a severe limitation of DOS, but one we must live with. One way we can do this is with the join command. The join command lets you use separate drives as one. The way it does this is by referring to the second drive as a subdirectory of the first. This lets you, in effect, refer to more than 32 megabytes under a single drive letter, if not a single directory. However, if you had a program which would only work with a single drive letter, this command might be just what you need. There are, however, still some limitations. You cannot use any of the following commands, check disk, disk copy, F disk, format, label, recover, or sys, while the join is in effect. This is because these commands work with the drive in a physical manner, but the drive you create with join is not one physical drive. Rather, it is two drives acting as one. To undo a join, use the slash D switch with the drive letter. To see the status of current joins, use the join command alone. And here's how to use join. Type join a colon c colon backslash drive two and strike enter. This command would enable you to use your A drive as the subdirectory drive two on the C drive. All the subdirectories of the A drive would still exist, but they are now subdirectories of drive two. Type join and strike enter. 
Using join by itself will display the current joins, if there are any. Using it after the first command would result in this, C colon backslash drive two. To undo this join, use this form of the command. Type join A colon slash D and strike enter. Then drive A is no longer joined to C colon backslash drive two. Our next command is the label command. This command is used to work with disk labels, the 11 character string which is used to identify disks. With this command, you can create a new label, change an old one, or delete it altogether. The current volume label of a drive is displayed in a directory listing or with the volume command. You can use the same characters in a volume label as you could in a file name, with the important addition of the space character. In effect, you're naming your disk just like you name individual files. If you use label alone, you will be prompted for a new volume label for the drive. Let's label drive C. Type label C colon, disk one, and strike enter. This sets the label of drive C to disk one. Type label, and strike enter. This results in the prompt volume in drive C is disk one. Here you may enter a new volume label. If you simply hit the return key, you will see the prompt, delete current volume label, yes or no. If you enter Y, the current label is deleted. If you enter N, the label is not changed. The mode command is next. Mode is one of the most versatile DOS commands. It can be used to set the operation of your parallel printer or the serial ports or the display. When used to set a parallel printer, mode can set the number of characters per line and the number of lines per inch that it will expect the printer to accept. The command will not actually change the way the printer prints, but only the way DOS expects it to print. Say, for example, that your printer is set up to print 132 characters per line. If you don't use the mode command, DOS will still only print 80 characters per line. To take full advantage of your printer's features, you need to use the mode command. You specify which printer's mode you wish to set, by the parameter LPT in the command. The number N you put after the LPT is the number of the printer, either one, two, or three. To tell DOS how many characters to print per line, you specify a number for the parameter CHARS. The valid numbers you can specify are 80 and 132 characters per line. To set how many lines per inch will be printed, you specify either six or eight lines per inch for the parameter lines. The final option you can specify for a parallel printer is slash P. The slash P switch tells DOS to continuously keep trying to print if a timeout error occurs. A timeout error happens when your printer is not ready to print at the time DOS sends it data. Normally, DOS will stop trying the first time an error occurs. To make DOS stop retrying when an error is occurring, you can press control break. The mode command is also used to set up the serial ports in your computer. With the mode command, you can set the baud rate, parity, number of data bits, number of stop bits, and error checking of the serial ports. First of all, you must tell DOS which serial port will be affected by the command. You do this by specifying either 1, 2, 3, or 4 in the place of the parameter M in the command. The colon after the serial port number is optional. Next, you must specify the baud rate. The baud rate is the speed at which the serial port communicates. The word baud stands for bits per second. The valid options you can specify for the baud rate are 110, 150, 300, 600, 1200, 2400, 4800, 9600, or 19200 baud. To specify a baud rate, you only have to use the two leftmost characters of the speed, although you may use all of them if you wish. The number is placed in the command directly after the serial port number. The placement is shown in the syntax by the parameter baud. To set up a serial port, you must specify the baud rate. After the baud rate, you can specify the parity. The parity is a way of checking for errors during transmission. You may specify the parity as even, odd, or none. This is done by placing an E, O, or N in the command in the place of the parameter parity. However, you do not need to specify the parity. If you do not, the parity will default to even. Following this, you can specify the number of data bits and the number of stop bits. 
These factors determine how each byte of data is configured when it is sent to and received from another device the computer is communicating with through the serial port. For the number of data bits, you can specify either 7 or 8. For the number of stop bits, you can specify either 1 or 2. The numbers you do specify for these parameters as well as for the other parameters depends on the configuration of the device with which the computer is communicating. The configuration you specify for the serial port with this command and the configuration of the device you are communicating with must match exactly for communication to take place. Finally, you can again specify a slash P after the command as you do for a parallel port. This will cause continuous timeout error checking for the serial port. When you perform a function such as a print screen, DOS normally sends all the print data to the first parallel port, LPT1. However, if you have a serial printer instead of a parallel one, you will want to change this. You do this with the next form of the mode command. You usually want to redirect output from LPT1 to either COM1 or COM2. You place the number of the parallel and serial ports in the places of the N and M in the syntax. You should be aware that you must first configure a serial port before you can redirect output to it. The final purpose of the mode command is to change the operation of the CRT, or monitor. You can change the number of characters per line that are displayed and whether or not color is to be used. The modes of display you can choose from are 40, 80, BW40, BW80, CO40, CO80, and mono. The numbers in these choices indicate the number of characters per line which will be displayed. The normal value for this is 80 characters per line. The other options indicate whether or not color will be displayed. If you use BW in the mode, color will not be displayed. And if you use CO, color will be enabled. I say enabled because color is not normally used in a DOS screen. This command only enables its use by other programs. The mono option is for use with a monochrome monitor. You ordinarily only need to use these commands in two instances. One, if you need to change the line length on the screen, or two, to change between monitors, should you have two connected to your computer. You may also use mode to shift the display left or right on the screen. To shift left, specify an L in place of the shift parameter, and use an R to shift right. You may use the T-switch to have DOS place a test pattern on the screen so that you can check if the characters are centered. The test pattern consists of a series of numbers which completely fill one line of the screen. Let's do some examples. Type mode LPT1 colon 132 comma comma P and strike enter. This would set the number of characters per line to 132 for the printer connected to LPT1, the first parallel port. In addition, DOS will continually retry on a timeout error. Type mode, com1, colon, 96, comma, n, comma, 8, comma, 1, comma, p, and strike enter. This would set up the first serial port, com1, to 9600 baud, no parity, 8 data bits, 1 stop bit, and continuous retry on errors. This is a typical way you might configure the serial port for use with a serial printer. Very often after doing this, you would want to redirect output from LPT1 to this serial port, COM1. You could do this like this. Type mode LPT1 colon equals COM1 colon and strike enter. This would send all the data which would normally go to the first parallel port, LPT1, to the first serial port, COM1, instead. To use the mode command with your display, or monitor, use a form like this. Type mode CO80 and strike enter. This would set the display to 80 characters per line and enable the use of color on the display. If you have two monitors connected to your system, this command will switch to the color monitor. More is the first command in this section. This is a very useful command when you have data to be displayed that is more than one screen full in length. To use this command, you must use it with a pipe or redirection. The first syntax shown is the way to use more with a redirection. In this case, you only need the more command by itself and the name of the file you want to display. 
The second form of the more command uses a pipe like we used in the find command. With this form of syntax, you must use more along with another command, such as type or directory. With this form of the command, more accepts the output of the first command and breaks it up into screens full of information. To work, more creates a temporary file which holds all of the information. Then, more displays this file one screen full at a time. This means that you must have at least as much free space on the disk as the amount of information you want to display. To see the next screen full of text, just strike any key. Suppose you had a large file called June Data Period Dat and you wanted to view it one screen at a time. You could use more like this. Type more less than June Data Period Dat and strike enter. You will then see the file June Data Period Dat displayed one screen full at a time. Hit Control C to stop the display. You could also use more with the type command like this. Type type June data period dat bar more and strike enter. This will result in the same output as the first example. Again, hit control C. Both forms of the command would work the same. The only difference is that one uses a pipe and one uses redirection. The next command is the print command. The print command is used to print out data files from the DOS prompt. In addition, it allows you to keep working as the file is being printed. There are some switches you can use with print, although normally they are not needed. The first switch determines which port the data will be sent to. You may select from LPT1 through 3 or COM1 through 4. Be aware that if you select a COM port, you should first use the mode command to configure the port. The next switch sets the size of the area in memory where the print command keeps data that is about to be sent to the printer. This is called the buffer. The size you may set can range from 512 bytes to 16,386 bytes. The larger you make the value of the buffer, the faster the computer will operate when printing. However, more memory is taken up as you make the buffer larger. The next value shown as the parameter slash u is the amount of time you allow the print command to wait for your printer if it is not ready when you start a print. If this amount of time elapses before the printer becomes ready, the file will not be printed. The value you specify is the number of clock ticks you want print to wait. There are about 18 clock ticks per second. The default value is 1. Related to this is the parameter slash m. This value is also specified in clock ticks. It, however, is the number of clock ticks print takes to print each character of the file. The final time-related parameter is the slash s. This is the time slice parameter. The value you place here is the number of clock ticks print takes away from your time on the computer to perform its tasks. The larger you make this, the faster your print job will finish, but the slower your computer will be while print is working. In most cases, the default value is acceptable. The rest of the switches and parameters have to do with the print queue. A queue is a list or line. In the case of the print command, the queue is the list of files which are waiting to be printed. This happens because you may specify more than one file to be printed. If a file is being printed when you give print another file name, the new file name is added to the print queue. The slash queue parameter is used to change the size of the print queue. By default, the print queue can hold 10 files. You may specify a value between 4 and 32. In order to change this, you must use the slash Q switch with print without any file name specified. If you need to remove files in the print queue, one of the switches you can use is the slash T. This switch removes all the files from the print queue, except, of course, the one that is currently being printed. To remove only a single file name from the print queue, you can use the slash C switch. This will remove any file name specified on the command line from the print queue. To add files to the print queue, you use the slash P switch. However, this is rather unnecessary because using print without any switches or parameters will add any file name on the command line to the print queue. Let's add a file to the print queue, which will cause it to be printed if your printer is attached and turned on. Now, type print 
may data period dat and strike enter twice. This adds the file may data period dat to the print queue. If there are no other files in the print queue, this file will start to print immediately. Next, type print June data period dat slash c and strike enter. Using the slash c switch like this will remove the file June data period dat from the print queue if June data period dat is in the print queue. Finally, type print and strike enter to see what files are currently in the print queue. And now the prompt command. Prompt is one command that you'll always know you have executed. That's because it changes the way the DOS prompt appears. As you know, the DOS prompt usually appears as the drive letter followed by a greater than sign. However, you can change the appearance of the DOS prompt in many ways. To set the DOS prompt, you can first specify a text string to be printed. Then you can follow this by a special code made up of a dollar sign followed by a single character. Now here's a list of the codes you can use. Here's a common and useful prompt command. Type prompt dollar sign P dollar sign G and strike enter. This will result in a prompt which shows the current drive and directory. This way you'll always know what directory you're currently in, such as C colon backslash lotus. If you like, you may also specify a text string to come before the path by doing the following. Type prompt the current path is dollar sign P dollar sign G and strike enter. This will result in the current path is C colon backslash lotus. The next command is the recover command. If you suspect that one or more sectors on one of your disks are bad, either from a check disk report or by errors while trying to read a file, you can possibly recover some data from the disk with this command. This command causes DOS to read as much of the file or disk as it can while skipping any bad sectors. This may sound great, but it's not always very effective. Unfortunately, by skipping the sectors that are bad, all you are left with is a file made out of the pieces that DOS was able to read. If the file you were recovering can be fixed by you, this might be okay. However, if the file was a program, it will no longer work, and there is no way to fix it short of finding an original copy that was not lost. The best protection you can take against losing data is to back up your files regularly. If you were to type recover C colon, this would begin the recovery process of drive C. I'm not going to perform this example because there are no bad sectors on my disk. Any files found with bad sectors will be fixed, but the parts of the files stored in the bad sectors will be lost. Now be careful when using recover. When you use recover on an entire disk, all the files are renamed. The new file names will be something like file 0000, file 0001, and so on. Strike control C. Type recover A colon letter one period doc and strike enter twice. This attempts to recover the file letter one period doc on drive A. Since this is a document, you may be able to patch it up if pieces are lost to bad sectors. We begin this section with the rename command. This command is used to change the name of a file or a group of files. You may use wildcards in the file name to apply the command to a group of files. Let's rename some files. Type ren c colon backslash graph1 space graph2 and strike enter. This will rename the file graph1 as graph2. Type ren asterisk period doc asterisk period ltr and strike enter. This renames all the files with the extension doc in the current directory to the same file name with the new extension ltr still in the current directory. 
The next command is the replace command. The replace command is kind of like a special copy command. It can perform two very useful functions. First, it will replace all the copies of a file on one drive with a copy you have on another drive. Now, this is very useful when you have to update a file with a new version. Second, it can go through a list of files on one drive and copy only the ones that don't exist on the second drive to the second drive. The first drive letter, path, and file name in the command are the source of the files. The second drive letter, path, and file name represent the destination. In addition, there are five switches which determine how replace works. If your intention is to replace files, you need not use a switch. By default, replace is in the replace mode. In the replace mode, the command copies every file on the source drive to the destination, if and only if the file is already on the destination drive. If your intention is to add new files, you should use the slash A switch. This will cause replace to copy every file from the source to the destination, as long as that file does not already exist on the destination disk. By using the slash P switch, you can have replace ask you before it replaces every file. If you say no, that file will be skipped, and replace will proceed to the next. Now, this is useful if you want to replace only some of the files that the command will find on the source disk. This can save you from having to use the command several times to accomplish this. If any of the files to be replaced have their attributes set to read only, you must use the slash R switch to have them updated. If you do not, you'll receive an error and the replace process will stop. One switch that is very helpful is the slash S. When you use this switch, replace will search all the subdirectories on the destination for files to be replaced. Note, however, that this cannot be used if you use the slash A switch to add files. If you're going to be using replace command with a floppy drive as either the source or destination, you may want to use slash W switch. This will cause the replace command to wait for you to change disks before it starts. Otherwise, replace will start operating as soon as you hit the return key. You cannot use replace with hidden files. Type replace a colon autoexec period bat space c colon backslash space slash s and strike enter. This command will replace all the occurrences of the autoexec period bat file on the C drive, even those in subdirectories, with the autoexec period bat file on drive A. Another way to use replace is to type replace a colon asterisk period asterisk C colon slash A and strike enter. This would add any files on drive A that aren't on the current directory on drive C to drive C. The next command is the restore command. This is the companion command to backup. In order to get back files you have backed up, you must use the restore command. This is because backup files are in a special format, which is not like the files were originally. The restore command puts the files back into their original format. The first drive letter in the syntax represents the drive which contains the files to be restored. This would normally be one of your floppy drives, such as A colon or B colon. The first switch used with the restore command is the slash S. This tells restore to work with all the subdirectories of the destination drive. If you don't use this switch, only the directory you specify will be restored. The slash P switch is much like the slash R switch we just talked about for the replace command. When you use the slash P, you will be asked for permission to restore any files that are marked read only on the destination drive. The next two switches have to do with the date of the files you are restoring. The slash B switch causes only the files with dates on or before the date you specify to be restored. On the other hand, the slash A switch causes only those with dates on or after the date specified to be restored. Similar to these are the next two switches, E and L. These are used to restore files with times earlier or later than the time you specify, respectively. If you only want to restore files that have been modified since the last time you did a backup, you can use the slash M switch. What this means is that only files with their archive bits turned on will be restored. However, you could also use the attrib command to set the archive bit the way you want. 
The final switch is the slash N. When you use this switch, only files that do not exist on the destination disk, but do exist on the backup disk, will be restored. This is an easy way to restore a file that you have accidentally erased. Now, we won't actually be using restore, but I'll show you what to type. Type restore a colon c colon backslash lotus backslash cps period wks. This is the way you would restore a single file. This command would restore the file cps period wks in the lotus directory from the backup disk or disks in drive A. Strike control C. To restore all the files from the backup, you could use a command like this. Type restore a colon c colon backslash asterisk period asterisk slash s. This would restore all the files on the backup to drive C, including those in all the subdirectories. Again, strike control C. This is the most common way of restoring an entire hard drive. The next command is the set command. This is a command that you may seldom use, but which you should understand. It is used to set the value of environment variables. A variable is an object which can take on different values. Every variable has a different name. A variable name is like a file name. It consists of a string of characters. This command makes a variable equal to a string. The reason that you should want to do this is because some programs examine these environment variables and change the way they operate based on the value of the variables. If any of the programs you have can do this, you will probably be instructed how to set these variables in the manual for that program. You can also use set to use variables in batch files. The section of the tape covering batch files will go into more detail concerning this. For example, type set drive equals C and strike enter. This is an example of how the set command might be used with an application program. You might use this set command if your application program is set up to read the value of the drive variable. The program may want to read this variable to determine what drive to use when saving data. Type set and strike enter. Using set by itself will display all the variables you currently have defined and what their values are. The share command is the first command in this section. This command is for use when you are working on a network. What it does is enable the use of file sharing and locking on your computer's hard disk. This is necessary for other people on the network to use the information on your hard disk. There are two parameters you can specify with the share command. The slash f parameter sets up how much space DOS uses to store information on file sharing. Each file you share with another user on the network takes 20 bytes to store. The default value for this parameter is 2048. The slash l parameter determines how many files can be locked at once. A file must be locked when it is necessary that only one network user have access to the file. The number you specify here is the number of files that can be locked at once. The default value is 20. If you type share slash f colon 1024 and strike enter, this sets up file sharing with 1024 bytes of space set aside to hold shared information. The next command is the sort command. This allows you to alphabetize a file or input from another command relative to some column in the data. And usually, if you have to sort a large amount of data, you'll probably be doing it directly in your database or a spreadsheet program. Now, most word processors also allow you to sort data. However, for simple infrequent cases, the sort command is a quick and free way to sort some data. The sort command does have its limitations. It can only sort data based on the one letter as the file in each character must lie in the same column of the file. A sort normally alphabetizes data in the normal manner. That is, A comes before Z and 0 comes before 9. However, if you use the slash R switch, this order will be reversed. To tell sort which column of the data you would like sorted, you use the slash plus switch. The value you specify for N will be the number of the column which will be sorted. There are two ways you can use the sort command. The first syntax shown is the way you use sort with another command. You might use sort with commands like directory or type. The second form of the command is used when you have a data file you want sorted. 
To sort a directory, type directory bar sort and strike enter. Now this is one of the most common ways to use the sort command. This command would first perform a directory, which is then piped into the sort command. Now since we haven't specified either the R or plus switches, the sort will be performed on the first character of the data, which in this case is a normal directory listing. If your directory listing is long, you might want to put the output into a file, which you can print out or look at later. You could do that like this. Type directory bar sort greater than sort directory period dat and strike enter. The sorted directory will be saved as sort directory period dat in the current directory. If you already have a file you would like to sort, you can use the second form of the command. Type sort slash plus five less than fgp period dat and strike enter. This would sort the file fgp period dat by the fifth column of each line. The result will be displayed on the screen. Now look at the fifth letter in each name and you'll see they're in alphabetical order. The next command is the substitute command. This allows you to refer to some subdirectory of a disk as a drive letter instead. This is useful with some older programs which cannot use subdirectories. For these programs, you can instead use drive letters, even though they will now refer to subdirectories on your hard drive, not to actual disk drives. The drive letter you specify will become what is called a virtual drive because it does not physically exist. Using substitute without any options will display the current substitutions in effect. To delete a substitution, use the slash D parameter with no other options. For example, type substitute E colon C colon backslash lotus and strike enter. Now using the command like this will set up the directory C colon backslash lotus to be referred to as the E drive. You can then save documents to the E drive, which is really C colon backslash lotus. To see what substitutions are in effect, type substitute and strike enter. This would display something like this. E colon is C colon backslash lotus. To remove the substitution, type substitute E colon slash D and strike enter. And you no longer have an E drive. The next command is the type command. The type command is very useful. You can use it quickly to see the contents of a batch file or of a data file that has data in the standard ASCII format. You should not use it to display program files since programs are made up of codes which won't mean anything when displayed. You can pause the output of this command by combining it with the more command as shown in the examples. You cannot use wildcards in the file name to display more than one file. Now, type, type, Joe, letter, period, doc, and strike enter. This displays the contents of the file Joe, letter, period, doc on the screen. You may pause the display by hitting Control S and restart it by Control Q. Now, type Joe, letter, period, doc, bar, more, and strike enter. This command uses a DOS pipe, the vertical bar, and the DOS command more to cause the output to pause every screen full of data. The display continues one screen full at a time when you hit any key. Using more is also helpful with other commands like check disk. In these examples I've been using type to display the contents of text files. However, were you to enter a command like type command period com and strike enter, all you would see would be gibberish since command period com is in code rather than text. The first command in this section is the version command, abbreviated VER. The version command is used to determine which version of DOS your computer is using. Now, this is not always the same as the version which is on your hard disk because you may have booted from a floppy disk with a different version of DOS. Simply type VER and strike enter. This will display the current version of DOS that your computer is operating, such as MS-DOS version 3.30. 
The next command is the verify command, and just like the slash V switch for the copy and X copy commands, the verify command causes DOS to check that any data written to the disk, whether hard or floppy, is written properly. It does this by checking the data on the hard disk after it has been written and compares it to the original data. If an error is found while verifying, you'll be notified by the computer. If you turn verify checking on, all data written to the disk will be checked until you turn it off or reboot. If you type verify without either on or off, DOS will display whether verify is currently on or off. Just type verify on and strike enter. This turns on verify checking until you turn it off or until you reboot. Now all copies you make will automatically be verified by the computer. Now type verify and strike enter. This will display the status of verify checking, such as verify is on. Next is the volume command. As we mentioned when talking about the label command, every disk has a label which you can use to identify its contents or use. Even though you can use label or directory to display the volume label of a disk, using volume is simpler because that's its only function. Simply type volume and strike enter. This will show the label of the drive you are currently in, such as volume in drive C is letters 1, or whatever the current label is. The next command is the xcopy command. The xcopy command is much like the copy command. However, this new DOS command is more suited to copying whole disks and directory trees than to single files or groups of files like copy is intended to do. With xcopy, you can easily copy a whole disk, subdirectories and all, to another disk with only one command. And this is not possible with the copy command alone. Xcopy is also unlike the disk copy command, which might seem to be similar. When using the disk copy command, the two disks you are using must be of the same type and format. In addition, disk copy does not work with hard disks, while xcopy excels in this area. Finally, using xcopy rather than disk copy will copy files in an unfragmented state. That is to say, if the source files are spread around in different parts of the disk rather than being in one continuous area, the copies of the files on the target disk will be continuous. This will not be the case with the disk copy command, since it copies sector by sector, not file by file. File fragmentation slows down the reading of files from a disk. Xcopy can also be used like backup, since it can copy subdirectories easily. You can use it to copy one whole hard disk to another hard disk, usually for backup purposes. However, unlike backup, you cannot use Xcopy to copy onto more than one floppy disk. Xcopy works similar to copy, but has some additional switches due to its different abilities. The first switch shown is the slash A. If you use this switch, Xcopy will copy only files which have their archive bit set. This is like the slash M switch for backup. However, it does not reset the archive bit once it has made the copy. If you want to reset the bit, Xcopy also has a slash M switch, which does this. The next switch is the slash D. Now, this is just like all the slash Ds we've talked about so far. You specify a date here, and only files with dates later than or on this date will be copied. This is handy for using xcopy as a backup method. A new switch we haven't seen before is the slash E. The slash E switch must, however, be used with the slash S. The slash S is like we have seen before. It is used to copy subdirectories. When you use slash S, all the subdirectories under the directory you are in, or the one you specified, will be searched for files to be copied. When you use the slash E switch, even empty subdirectories will be copied. Now, this lets you copy a directory structure as well as files. Using the slash S and the slash E, you can be assured that every file in every directory, as well as the directories themselves, will be copied. And the three other switches, slash P, slash W, and slash V, are very, very simple. The slash P is used to have DOS pause before it copies each file and asks you for permission to do so. You may say yes or no for each file. The slash W is used to have X copy wait so that you can put the correct floppy disks in the drives before it starts. You might have to do this if the xcopy command itself is on a disk different than the ones you want to copy. And finally, there is the slash v. Just like with the copy command, using slash v will assure that the copies made are correct by having DOS check them as they're made. If you want to use xcopy to copy an entire disk, you can use a form like this. Type xcopy, c colon, backslash, space, d colon, slash s slash e 
and strike enter. This will copy all files and directories on drive C to drive D. In effect, this example is like using disk copy for floppies, but here you're copying one hard disk to another. Of course, if you don't have a D drive, this won't work. The reason I mention this is because D drives aren't that common on most systems, whereas a C drive is. And be aware of what your system has so you can efficiently use DOS in the future. That concludes this chapter. You now have seen nearly every DOS command and an example of how to use it. By combining these commands, you can use your computer to its fullest potential. In the next few chapters, I'll show you some of the ways to use these commands regularly. In addition to the 47 DOS commands that we just covered, there are eight additional commands that are used in the DOS configuration file. This file is given the special file name config period sys, as you saw when we created one earlier in the lesson. The config period sys file is a very special part of DOS. It allows you to change the way DOS operates, its configuration. For example, one of the most common functions of the config period sys file is to set up the computer to enable it to use a mouse. You can do this with a device command. Now, each of the config commands works similar to the normal DOS commands. They each have a particular syntax which must be followed. However, these commands cannot be entered on the DOS command line. Instead, they must be entered in the form of a text file, and one command following the next. And here's an example of a config period sys file you might create. Type copy con config period sys. Strike enter. Type buffers equals 25. Strike enter. Type files equals 30. Strike enter. Type device equals ms mouse period sys. Strike enter. Strike f6 and strike enter. You can create a config period sys file either with a word processor that can create text files or with the copy command like we did here. This config period sys file sets buffers and files for data storage while you're using your computer. It also sets DOS up to work with a mouse. In the next section, I'll show you each of the commands you can use with a config period sys. You can use as many of these commands as you wish when creating your config period sys file. Now, be sure to type them in as I have shown you when creating sample config period sys files and check to see that you have used the correct syntax. Here are the configuration commands. The first command in this section is the break command. This command is just like the normal DOS command break. There is a special keystroke called break, which causes the execution of many programs to stop. And normally when DOS is running a program, it only checks for you typing a break, that is a control C or control break, when it performs I.O. to a peripheral. Now I.O. functions include writing on the screen, printing on the printer, or waiting for the user to type something in. However, you can change this if you turn break checking on, DOS will check for a break under many more circumstances, such as using the floppy or hard disk. This might be useful if you are not quite sure what a command or program will do and want to have an opportunity to stop it. However, turning extended break checking on can slightly slow the execution of your programs. If you want your programs to run faster, you can always turn break checking off again if you need to. For example, if you type break equals on in your config period sys file, this turns extended break checking on. Buffers is the next command. This command is used to set up disk buffers. Disk buffers are used to store in RAM memory recently accessed data from your disks. By doing this, disk access speed can be increased. This is because many times the same data is accessed over and over again. If this data is in a buffer, it can be accessed much, much quicker because RAM is so much faster than a disk. You specify the number of disk buffers you would like to set up by the number N in the syntax. Each buffer uses 512 bytes of RAM. The number you should specify for N depends both on how much RAM you have and how large your disks are. If you have only floppy disks, you probably don't need to specify the buffers command. Just let DOS set the value to its default, which ranges from 2 to 15. 
However, if you have a hard disk, you may want a larger value than DOS would normally use, especially if you have 640K of RAM and or a turbo type computer. You might want a value such as 20 or 30. In your config period sys file, just type buffers equals 35 to set up 35 buffers for disk reads. Device is the next command. This is one of the most used but least understood commands in the config period sys file. It's used to load special programs that enable the computer to use special devices, which DOS does not normally support, such as a mouse. To use this command, you normally follow instructions that come with the program you're installing. Usually, all you need to add to your config period sys file is the name of the program file which came with the equipment you are going to use. In some cases, you may also need to add switches or parameters after the file name, as you would with many DOS commands. Each time you add a device driver with the device command, and you can add as many as you need, you load the program specified by the file name into memory. These programs are specially written to remain in memory while your computer is operating and control the devices with which they came. Now, the order you enter these programs into the config period sys file usually does not matter. However, you should carefully check the instructions that come with each device to make sure. For example, type device equals c colon backslash drivers backslash ms mouse dot sys in your file. And this would load the device driver called msmouse.sys, which is stored in the driver's subdirectory, if such a device and subdirectory exists on your computer. Now, this program is the one Microsoft sells with its mouse. Drive parm, or drive parameters, is the next command. Drive parameter command is used to tell DOS that new or different parameters should be used for some storage device in your system, such as a disk drive. Say you replace the second disk drive in your system, a 360K drive, with a 3.5-inch drive, which is a 720K device. In order for DOS to know that this has been done, you must use the drive parm command. The slash D parameter tells DOS which drive it is you want to set up. The value for N can be from 0 to 255. The first disk drive is number 0, the second 1, and so on. The slash C switch is used to enable the use of what is called change line support. When you use the slash C switch, DOS will look to see if the drive door is closed or open. If the door is open, it will assume that there is no disk in the drive. If you use the slash C, you may on occasion see a message on the screen asking for a disk to be inserted into the drive. It's not necessary to use this switch unless you have a specific application for it. The rest of the parameters specify how the device works. The first and most important is the slash F. The slash F tells DOS the form factor of the device you're using. The form factor is the size and capacity of the device. The value you place here is determined by this list. For example, the default value is 2, a 720 kilobyte 3.5 inch disk drive. If the device you are installing is anything except a hard drive or tape drive, you need not use the rest of the parameters. If not, the other parameters specify how many heads, sectors per track, and tracks per side the device has. And finally, the slash N switch specifies that the device is not removable, like a floppy disk is. If you type drive parameter equals slash D colon 1 slash F colon 7 in your config file, you'll set up the use of a 1.44 megabyte 3.5 inch disk drive as the second disk drive on your system, drive B. The first command of this section is the FCBS command, or file control blocks. There are two ways that a program can open a file. One way is with file handles. We'll look at that procedure after we finish with this one. The other way is by using file control blocks. Using file control blocks is an old method of opening files. It is no longer recommended to be used by programmers. However, if you have an old application program that needs to open several files at once, such as an old database, you may need to use this command in your config period sys file. The values of X and Y specify how many files can be opened simultaneously and how many cannot be closed by DOS automatically. The default values of these parameters are 4 and 0. 
the values you specify can be between 1 and 255. You should only use this command if you are having problems with an old application program. Here's how to use FCBS. FCBS equals 10, comma, 5. Using FCBS like this sets up 10 files to be opened simultaneously using file control blocks and allows only five of these to be closed by DOS if necessary. The next command is the files command. As I said, this is the preferred method for opening files by an application program. This command allows you to specify how many files can be opened at once. The number you specify for X is the number you will allow. If you're not using a database, windowing, or accounting program, you can probably get away with the default value of 8. If you're using one of these programs, you may want to use this command to increase this value. And usually the number you need will be specified in the manual that came with your program. However, if it is not, a value like 20 is usually sufficient. Like all commands of this nature, the higher the number you use, the less RAM you will have to work with. But the decrease in RAM is usually small. To use files, just type something like files equals 25. This sets up 25 files to be opened using file handles simultaneously. If you see an error message like too many files open in your application program, you might try increasing the value of the files command you are using. The next command is the last drive command. The last drive command is needed when you add more than the usual amount of drives to your computer. Most times you have at most five drives in your system. Two floppies, maybe two hard disks, and possibly a RAM disk. Since each drive needs a drive letter, this means that the letters A through E are needed in most cases. By no coincidence, E is the default for the last drive command. However, if you add drives to your computer, maybe to use a network drive, you will have to increase the number of drive letters available. And you can do this with the last drive command. The letter you specify for D is the last letter you want to use. If you type last drive equals F, in your config file, this will add one more letter to those available for drive usage. Now, by doing this, you can use up to six drives in your computer. Another command is the stacks command, the final config period sys command. This command is a little more technical than we would like to get into here, but one you might need nonetheless. If you ever have your machine freeze up when you hit a key or you see a message containing the word stack, you probably have a stack problem. The default values for stacks are, for an IBM PC or XT, 0 and 0. For other computers, 9 and 128. If you get stacks errors, try increasing the first number, the number of stacks, by 2 or 3 at a time until the problem stops. If this doesn't work, increase the second number, the size of the stacks, to 256 or 512 bytes. If you type stacks equals 5, comma, 128. This sets up five stacks of 128 bytes each. Now that you're familiar with the config.sys file commands, let's take a look at batch files. Now that you know how to use the most important and useful DOS commands, you can begin to do many powerful things with your computer, making it much easier to use. You'll soon find that you end up doing many things over and over again. For example, to run your word processing software, you may first have to set a path to the directory where the program files are, then change to the directory where your documents are, and finally run the program. When you're through, you have to change back to the root directory and reset the path. Now, this type of repetitive task is exactly what computers are for. And the way to have your computer quickly perform these tasks is through batch files. You learned a little bit about batch files when you set up the hard disk in an earlier section. Batch files are files which contain normal DOS commands and are executed by DOS together in a batch. Here's what a batch file might look like. Now this batch file would first change the directory to Lotus, then execute the Lotus program. When you're through using Lotus, the batch file continues executing. The directory is changed back to the root directory, the screen is cleared, and a directory is displayed. 
All batch files must have the extension bat. To run a batch file, simply type its file name like you would with any other program. DOS will search the current directory and all the directories in the path for the batch file. If DOS finds the batch file, it will then be executed. A special type of batch file is the automatically executing type. This batch file is named autoexec.bat, and you can create one on any bootable disk. This batch file is special in that it will be executed automatically whenever the computer is booted from the disk on which it resides. You do not have to type in its name to have it execute, but it must be in the root directory for it to be found by DOS. A batch file is a text file, so it can only contain characters and numbers. Because of this, if you want to use your word processor to create a batch file, you must be sure that it can save files in an ASCII format. This means that only alphanumeric characters will be put in the file. And most word processors can do this. If yours won't, or if the batch file will be small, you can create them with the copy command, as we did in the hard disk setup. To create a batch file with the copy command, type in this command line copy con file name period bat. Copy con tells DOS to copy everything you type into the file you named in the command. Con stands for keyboard in DOS. You'll then see a blank line appear under this command. DOS is now ready for you to enter the commands in the batch file. You can enter as many lines of commands as you like, but once a line is entered, you cannot back up to correct a mistake, so be careful what you type. If you do make a mistake, you can start over by hitting Control-C and then repeat the process. When you're done, hit the F6 key. You'll see a caret Z appear on the screen. This tells DOS that you're done entering text. Then hit Return and your batch file will be created. Since batch files are so powerful, you'll want to use them regularly. For beginners, it's kind of difficult to utilize the full power of batch commands. For this reason, I'd like to give you some examples of batch files that might be useful on your system. First, the autoexec.bat file is an important part of your system. In the autoexec.bat file, you'll want to do many things. You'll want to set up the paths for your system, check the date and time, and so on. Here's a typical autoexec.bat file. This is the batch file only, not what you should type when creating it. You enter batch files exactly the same way you enter config period sys files. Now this file sets the path to the directory shown, which allows programs not in the current directory to be run. It also shows and allows you to change the date and time. Then it sets the prompt to display the current drive and directory. After that, it clears the screen and shows you a directory. It's even possible to create a menu of sorts using the autoexec.bat file. The menu will allow you to run the programs you use most often by simply hitting two keys. Here's an example. First, create an autoexec.bat file like this one. Then create a file called menu.bat using these commands. When you run this batch file, you'll see the menu displayed like this. Type the number of the program you want and hit return. Number one to run Lotus, number two to run Microsoft Word, number three to run DBase3. Of course, you should replace the programs I've used here with the ones you have and run the most. You can add as many or put as few as you want as long as you make the corresponding batch files to run the programs, as I'll show you in just a minute. Also in this batch file, you saw a new word, echo. This is a batch file command. It displays whatever follows it on the screen. You can use it to display things as I've done here. If you didn't use echo and simply input the text you want to be displayed, DOS would try to execute the first word on the line, like type, as a command. This would cause your file to go haywire. DOS would be trying to execute commands which weren't intended to be commands. They were supposed to appear on the screen as a menu. Echo can be used with two special words, on and off, in a different way. When you use the command echo off, all the commands after that point will not be shown on the screen as they are executed. To turn this feature back on, as it should normally be, use the echo on command. Now, one more thing you might notice when you create this or any other batch file. If you create a batch file using copy con, 
and hit return on the last line of the file, followed by F6, then return again, you will see two DOS prompts displayed when the batch file runs. To have only one prompt displayed, you need to hit F6 immediately after the last line, before you hit a return, then hit return after the F6. To make this menu work, you need three other batch files. The first one is called 1.bat, cd backslash lotus, lotus, cd backslash, menu. Now these are the commands that you want to be executed if you select number one from the menu. The next is called 2.bat, cd backslash word, word, cd backslash, menu. And finally, 3.bat, cd backslash dbase, dbase, cd backslash menu. All of these batch files assume you have your hard disk set up in a certain way. They assume that you have the directories called Lotus, Word, and DBase. Of course, you can substitute your own subdirectories and programs as needed. When your autoexec.bat file runs and you receive the menu, you can type 1, 2, or 3 and strike enter. The appropriate batch file will be run to execute the program listed in the menu. Then when you're done using the chosen program, the menu is run again. Another useful batch file is one which helps prevent your hard disk from being formatted accidentally, either by you when you're learning DOS or by someone else who might be using your computer. The first thing you must do is rename the file format.com that came with DOS to the new name, frmt.com. You must do this because you want your new batch file to have the name format. If both files had the same file name, DOS would execute whichever one is found first. Use the rename command to do this first. After that, create the batch file format.bat with these commands. You can see them in your manual. What this does is prevent anyone from typing format in any combination of C colon, slash S, and slash V, since this would result in the formatting of the hard disk drive C colon. A format attempt on drive A or B will be allowed, so you can format floppy disks. Again, we've used some new commands. The F command works by checking what comes after it for truth. If the expression is true, the command following the expression is executed. If not, the process continues to the next line. The colon end is called a label. You can use this as a point to jump to in the file. The command which does the jumping is go to. When go to is executed, it causes DOS to go to the point specified after the go to and start executing commands at that point. In this case, it causes a jump to the end of the batch file which ends the execution of the batch file and thus the format is never allowed to be run. The percent one is called a replaceable parameter. It is very similar to the variables we talked about with the set command. The percent one parameter gets assigned whatever comes after the command you enter. Likewise, there are other variables, percent zero through percent nine, which gets other values like so. Say you typed in the command, command A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. The variables would have the following values. 0% equals command, 1% equals A, 2% equals B, 3% equals C, and so on. For example, if I typed format C colon slash S, the percent 0 would be replaced by format, and the percent 1 will be replaced in the batch file by C colon slash S. As I said, you can use up to nine of these replaceable parameters, percent 1 through percent 9. The parameter percent zero also stands for the drive name on which the file is executed. You can also use named parameters in your batch files. These are the variables that I talked about in the set command. For example, if I type the command set drive name equals C, I could use the variable percent drive name percent in a batch file. It would be equal to C, such as check disk percent drive name percent slash v. This would run the check disk command on whatever drive percent drive name percent was equal to, in this case, drive c. With these parameters, you can create some pretty complex batch files. In fact, most installation programs that come with various application programs are really just complex batch files using parameters, if statements, and go-tos. By combining these same commands and all the DOS commands you've learned, you are on your way to becoming a PC power user. Now you know how to use batch files. In the next and final chapter, I'll discuss hard disk management.
Okay, you have come a long way since you started this lesson. You've learned about all the important DOS commands, the config commands and batch files. Now it's time to learn what it's all about using DOS on a day-to-day -day basis. DOS is made to run disks, and in this section I'm going to tell you about hard disk management. Managing your hard disk effectively is what DOS is all about, at least as far as the user is concerned. We'll talk about two things, how to organize your hard disk and how to make sure it's running well. Organizing your hard disk is one of the most important aspects of hard disk management. A well-organized hard disk allows you to easily run programs, update programs, find data files, and makes your computer run more efficiently overall. Now, here are some guidelines for organizing your hard disk. First, put everything in subdirectories. The only files you should need in the root directory of your hard disk are command.com, autoexec.bat, and config period sys. Place DOS in its own directory, each of your application programs in their own directory, any device drivers you need in a directory, and all of your batch files in a directory. You can then use a path command in your autoexec.bat file to set up paths to the DOS device driver and batch file directories. In addition, if you have groups of data files that belong together, you can make subdirectories within the program directories for each one. For example, under your Lotus subdirectory, you could have a directory for tax spreadsheets, another for monthly budgets, still another for business files, and so on. Also, be sure to give each of these subdirectories a name which makes their contents easy to determine. Although to the novice this seems like a lot of trouble, in time you'll begin to see the advantages. As you get more and more files on your disk, it becomes harder to find the files you need. If your files are well organized, this becomes much easier. This directory structuring also makes updating your programs or software very easy. For example, suppose you get a new word processing package and you want to replace your old one with it. If you have one subdirectory which contains your old word processor, you can simply delete all the files in that directory. Then copy the new word processor into the now empty word processing subdirectory. In a matter of just minutes, you have completely upgraded your word processor. However, if you had all of the word processing program files mixed in with your spreadsheet files, you would have a difficult time determining which files belong to which program. This would substantially increase the amount of time necessary to delete the old word processor files. Organizing your disk in this way also makes it easier to quickly run backup on only the files that are important to you rather than backing up all the files each time. With all these files on your disk, there are several things you need to do to make sure the hard disk continues working and running efficiently. For one, you should run check disk every once in a while to make sure that you don't have file problems. Second, do a little spring cleaning every month. Clean out or delete old files or move them onto diskettes for long time storage. You'd be surprised how fast you can run out of disk space if you don't clean up every once in a while. There are also some ways you can help speed up your drive. Make sure that you have a config dot sys file with a buffers command set up for your size disk and computer type. You may also want to investigate a disk caching program. Now, these programs set up what we call a disk cache. This is similar to a buffer but works even more effectively. In many cases they can speed up your disk several hundred percent. Now, these programs are available from many different sources. Check with your dealer for more information. Another type of program you might want is called a disk optimizer or compressor. When you save a file on your disk, it may not be saved in one continuous section. Rather, pieces of the file may be saved in different parts of the disk. Now, this slows down file retrieval time, since the drive must move around to different parts of the disk when retrieving that file. Now, what a disk optimizer or compressor does is rearrange the sectors on your hard disk so that all the parts of each file are located in the same part of the disk. All the files of each subdirectory are also placed together on the disk, and this helps to increase the speed of your disk. And finally, you should use the fast open command in your autoexec.bat file. Now, this helps speed up the opening of files. For a more detailed explanation, see fast open. And one final suggestion is that you frequently run backup on your hard disk. Now, this way, if your disk ever goes bad, you won't lose all of your important files. And by utilizing these helpful points, your hard disks will be easily manageable and will run quickly and efficiently. 
In effect, hard disk management is like keeping good records in a file cabinet. By managing your disk wisely, you turn your computer into an incredibly useful tool. Otherwise, it may become a frustrating monster. Well, we've covered an awful lot of material in this lesson. You've learned about PCs and about the disk operating system. In effect, these DOS commands I've shown you are the ingredients for using your computer effectively. There are a multitude of ways to combine these commands, and this is what makes you an expert user of your computer. I've tried to give you some helpful examples of how to use various commands, as well as auto-exec batch files and config files. By using your computer frequently, you'll discover the power these commands really give you. Before you know it, you'll be as comfortable using your computer as you are driving your car. By efficiently using your computer, you'll soon have a lot of extra time on your hands, too, which you can spend in your business or personal endeavors. And who can use a little more time these days? Thank you.